Joining me now is Stephen Mosher. He is Population Research Institute president. He's also author of the new book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Pandemics, about which more in a moment. But Stephen, first, what do you make of an administration that calls a, a CCP threat against the second in line of the presidency? No drama. Well, I think that the Chinese Communist Party has been disrespectful. Uh, and aggressive towards the Biden administration from the time that uh, Joe Biden was sworn in as president. You recall the meeting between uh, Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, and the Chinese Foreign Minister in Alaska just a couple of months into the administration. The Chinese Foreign Minister, for the first time that I can remember, spent 20 minutes haranguing uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, not in tones of, of respect or politeness, but absolutely aggressive rhetoric. And that's continued to the present day. So I think you see during the phone call between Xi Jinping soon to be president for life of China, and Joe Biden a few days ago, uh, he was uh, reportedly very, very aggressive towards the American president. So yeah. that, that the former respect that the Communist Party has shown the United States has gone away. I, I think what's striking here for me is that Nancy Pelosi was warned by the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, was warned by the Secretary of Defense not to go. They laid out the, the U.S. Uh, foreign policy towards China of the Biden administration, and Nancy Pelosi said, I'm going anyway. What does it say when the third-ranking uh, Democrat in, in, in the whole United States says that the U.S.-China policy uh, doesn't work and she's going to ignore it? It's, it's extraordinary. But uh, again, what does it say about this administration that they don't get what clearly people like you who understand China, I mean, you live there, you, you did, you've written many books about China, et cetera. Uh, you know that when, when instead of fighting back, particularly after there's a direct threat against one of the leaders of our country, a, a key leader of our country, instead of fighting back, you, you sit back and, and try to say, no, no, I'm sure that uh, there's, there's no drama here, et cetera. I mean, that's, that's, they take that, I would assume, you correct me if I'm wrong, as a, a definitive sign of weakness. Well, absolutely. I mean, this, this administration seems to specialize in projecting weakness and not strength. And as I say, Nancy Pelosi herself apparently is rejecting uh, U.S. policy towards China by going to Taiwan. Now, she's got a district in San Francisco where there are a lot of Chinese Americans, many of whom are from Taiwan, many of whom fled communist China decades ago. So she's always played to that constituency a little bit. She unfurled a banner on Tiananmen Square criticizing the uh, Communist Party back in the 90s. But in 2008, beginning in 2008, the Chinese Communist Party has tried to offer sweetheart deals uh, to the Pelosi's, Paul Sr. and Paul Jr. Uh, Peter Schweitzer has written about this. And I think the Communist Party is upset here in part because they thought that, that she had joined the team and now she's uh, leaving the reservation. Well, to what extent is, if, if at all, are, are Biden's relation, Biden's family relations with, with China that we've heard so much about through Hunter, through other members of his family, to what extent does that shade the president's decision vis-a-vis -vis China? Well, you've got, you've got the Biden uh, family interest in China still apparently uh, has not disinvested from China. We don't know the details of his investments in China. We've never been told. Uh, we have the, the obvious health problems of President Biden, not just with COVID, but longer term health problems uh, with mental acuity. Uh, we've got a vice president who um, is obviously unschooled in foreign policy. I mean, I, if I were the Chinese leader, I would think now is my opportunity to advance my country's interests on the world stage because America is apparently leaderless. Yeah. And, and Stephen, I want to give you about 45 seconds. It's all the time we have. But to talk about the subject of your book, they never paid a price. Uh, for spreading the pandemic the way that they did. There are still questions. I know you're convinced it was a lab leak, as are others, uh, but, but they clearly, what is indisputable is at a time when they realized it was transferable through human contact, through, through air contact, uh, they were allowing people from Wuhan to go to Italy, to go to the United States, but preventing them to go to other places in China. So they knew they purposely were infecting the rest of the world and creating this pandemic. Never paid a price. Uh, is, that, is it impossible to believe that they ever will? 
Well, I hope I hope they will pay a price. I mean, it is after all the China virus. I believe it came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It was leaked out during vaccine trials when they were trying to develop a vaccine against it to protect their own people. But as you say, they stopped flights to Beijing from Wuhan and Shanghai and Guangzhou, but they let flights continue to Milan and New York City and Madrid and other places which became COVID hotspots. So that was a deliberate spread. Um, millions of people died trillions of dollars in economic damage. I'm afraid that lurking in a test tube somewhere, perhaps in the Wuhan Institute of Virology itself, is another virus that has been genetically engineered that they will release. Why wouldn't they? They paid no price for releasing this one. They've come out of it relatively stronger. Uh, tell me why they wouldn't do it again. Extraordinary. It's an amazing story. Generations ahead of us. Uh... Uh, we'll just wonder what the heck we were thinking, why they were allowed to do what they did. Stephen, uh, the, the name of the book, once again, is The Politically Incorrect Guide to Pandemics. I haven't read it yet, but I am certainly going to. And I thank you for writing that book. And I thank you for being here, Stephen.